All right, so uh, hello everyone. So today we're glad to have uh, Jonas, uh, Dr. Jonas Wong from Parameter Institute and uh, gave a talk on derived static equivalence for goodman jacquet monoids. Please. All right. uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, and I'll be talking about joint work with Chao Xian Chen uh, and the papers in preparation. Uh, so that line, I'll give some overview of the main result, which is some kind of geometric version of local unramified Gordon okay. theory. Uh, and then uh, kind of this fits into some or two sort of yes. more general frameworks that are connected. Mm -hmm. uh, one is uh, this relation to conjectures of Benz via Saccharides and Lektesh, and then the other is um, these proposals of Braverman and Kajdan. Um, so basically like kind of our work can, is, can be seen as like a special case of both of those. And we were interested because maybe it'll lead to more insights about those general conjectures. Uh, and then I'll talk a little about some properties, um, which is one, for example, one of them is related to how you can get the Fourier transform. Uh, in like a kind of different way. Uh, and then finally, uh, like uh, some aspect that's important to the proof, which is sort of only seen in this geometric picture, I would think, and not so common in the analytic story is some, um, there's going to be some invariant theory uh, of some like algebraic varieties involved, um, which, yeah, I don't know if that, well, it ha if it has any implications to applications to uh, like the classical theory, but um, it's it was very interesting like when we were doing this project. Uh, okay, so to start the overview, so I'll be talking about just the uh, local situation today, and uh, I'll be doing stuff over this um, non-Archimedean local field, but uh, of equal characteristic. So this uh, field of Laurent series. Uh, and so in the title, this Gordon Jacquet monoid just meant n by n matrices, which is a monoid or semi-group under multiplication. Um, but okay, so there's some general stuff about monoids that we'll get to later. Um, okay, but so yeah, Gordon Jacquet like constructed the local standard L function by considering the spectral de decomposition of this short space, which in this case is just locally constant complex order functions on. Um, the F point of N by N matrices. Uh, and so I will consider a slight variant where well, basically you kind of decompose it with respect to the Plancherel measure, uh, but for like something like L2 of GLN of F. Um, and so nowadays, uh, it's becoming, I guess, increasingly important to kind of study ge like more categorical or geometric versions of these um, function spaces. And so I'll talk about some kind of reasons for this, but like there's also, uh, or there's just, I guess, more and more reasons that are coming up lately. But these are for function fields, right? Yes. Okay. Um, All right. Which, well, yeah, so like there's some hope. Yeah, like if you can get it to work for function fields, then this stuff with diamonds can get something to work also for number fields, but like <laughs> I will not talk about that. Uh, yeah, so like how you like get a geometrization? Well, so if you wanted to start with functions, then the natural thing is to just, there's a function achieve dictionary. So you go to such an achieves on this, uh, well, something like MN of F, but so I kind of, I won't talk about what this is, but it's actually some like very infinite dimensional uh, like algebraic variety, which is actually rather complicated. But for this talk, basically we can just kind of think about this as a set, uh, but, so there is some kind of sheaf theory here. And for like, because of this infinite dimensionality, like you have to maybe 
be a little careful about definitions, but I won't really get into that. Uh, but then, so like we're not really talking about all functions, but you want locally constant functions. So like you would need to put some other conditions here. Uh, and so like today I'll only be talking about the unramified situation. Uh, so in this case, you just want by invariant functions, which well, like set there theoretically, you just consider sheaves on uh, like this double quotient space, but like technically you would have to consider this as some kind of very complicated infinite dimensional stack. So there's a bunch of like technical issues here, but like basically it's something that can be made sense of. Um, uh, and then, so there's this, uh, basically this idea, which uh, or let me just say the idea first is like somehow, uh, so gold modular K theory is a little more specific because you're really considering or like this pairing between the short space and uh, some matrix coefficients, but like slightly looser, you can just consider uh, like the Plancharel decomposition inside of L2 for these source functions. Uh, and the idea is like, if everything were, or like kind of, if things weren't infinite dimensional and you had some kind of uh, left shed's trace formula, then there is kind of a way that you can compute these uh, Plancharel decompositions or which are just some kind of like numbers uh, by taking trace of Frobenius of some uh, derived uh, homs inside of this derived category. Uh, so this is not completely rigorous because as I said, there's a lot of infinite dimensional stuff. The idea is that basically somehow if you study this category and then like look at, or you want some kind of like basically spectral decomposition of the category, uh, then from this, uh, like if you also care about like what happens at the level of like X or like derived Homs, then you'll also be able to see this information about uh, like the spectral information or like asymptotic behavior of this short space. And that'll just give you the L function. Um, okay, so this is kind of like the, how you can get this or predict maybe what kind of categorical result you want. Uh, and then so the given this, the result is actually easy to state. Uh, and also, so in order to simplify things, I'm going to take uh, or kind of forget about Frobenius and only think about the everything over F cube bar. But um, like if you put it back in, I think it's basically almost the same result will hold with some kind of weights uh, added. Uh, okay, and then so, V will mean the standard representation of GLN. So that's the L function that you want. Uh, and so the, the theorem, which kind of, well, it's motivated by the, the classical theory is that if you take this kind of categorical version of bi-invariant sheaves, then there will be an equivalence of category with something spectral. Uh, so the right-hand side means, uh, so, Basically, if you forget the shifts, then this just means like some perfect complexes or like quasi coherent sheaves or just modules over the ring of functions of this space. Um, but then uh, somehow, because I said things are derived, actually, you want to consider this as like a, a graded uh, ring uh, where there's some particular gradings um, that show up. Uh, and then you, you, know, you consider it as a graded ring, but actually as a differential graded ring where the differentials are zero. And then the right-hand side should be considered as like DG modules over this DG ring. Um, okay, but let me say like kind of classically, the idea is, is just that uh, like if you look at this kind of space, um, then kind of the, if you consider it's L2 decomposition, uh, well, like kind of the, the representations are still just going to be representations of uh, like, or parameterized by Langlands parameters for GLN. And that's where this kind of GLN equivariance comes from. Um, and then this copy of the Lie algebra or the, for GLN 
really corresponds to just the Plancharel measure on L2 GON. So that's kind of, well, as we'll see, like that doesn't have anything to do with the fact that we're using matrices. It's just coming from the fact that we're kind of studying functions on GON F. Um, and then, so it's kind of the standard uh, and the dual standard appearing is really what's signifying that somehow because you're considering functions on matrices, you will kind of get this L function out of here. And there's kind of a doubling because as I said, uh, be like this, in this kind of picture, somehow the, the like derived Homs are, are really sh computing like some norm squared. Uh, so since somehow the spectral decomposition gives an L function, so the square will give two copies. Okay, so yeah. And okay, so, but so now I'm going to talk about kind of some bigger theory that this fits into. And so one just first remark or observation is that, so I consider this kind of GL, Lie algebra times V times V star, but if I just added another copy of GLN, um, so if I add a copy to the ring of functions and then also add another copy in terms of the equivariance, they will cancel each other out. Um, so I could actually consider like GLN squared equivariant uh, sheaves on this ring of functions, uh, which is actually equal to the cotangent space of um, just the group GLN times the standard representation. Uh, and so okay, so have, somehow- so, so this V2, is that a gradient? Yeah. So, uh, uh, so, so, so how, how is that graded? Uh, yeah, so the two here means that, so if I take ring of functions of it, it becomes sim of this thing. And so this means that uh, kind of all of the generators in V dual are going to be in degree positive two. So for example, like if N is one, then you'll have like one generator in degree two, another generator in degree two, and then a generator in degree zero. And yeah, so I should say maybe like the two here is fixed, but somehow the fact that you have two and then zero is really somehow related to the fact that I, something about the way I, Kind of define this category, and it has to be with, do with infinite dimensionalness. Uh, so there's ways to kind of change this to zero to like zero two or even one one. Uh, so the there's some ambiguity in like the sh the shifts. Is there an apparent connection to um, Zutake, the geometric stuff? Yeah, uh, I guess I will get to that. Um, but basically, like, yeah, Satake so kind of corresponds to on this side, you have GON, and then this side, like, you just see everything except for this V times V dual. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so now I want to say somehow how this fits into uh, this picture of relative duality or this relative Langlands program, uh, and especially ideas of Benz v. Sacrages and Venkatesh. Uh, so the it's a special case of this duality where so I already said somehow if I think of so the group acting on the, the analytic side it should really, it's really two copies of GLN. And so from now on, I'll just call that G. And then, so then the Langlands dual is also two copies. So it's natural to consider like the ans this answer I said, which is in terms of the cotangent bundle of something. Um, but then, so somehow L2 or just basically somehow an analytic functions on uh, some space 
is really considered as some kind of quantized version of just the cotangent um, bundle for the space itself. Uh, so in this way, like this previous quality or like Goldman JK, you can somehow phrase it as there's some matching between the cotangent bundle of n by n matrices and this other cotangent bundle that I got that was corresponding to the standard L function. Uh, so more generally, there's this prediction that like if you started with any smooth affine spherical variety, which I won't say what it is, but for example, like n by n matrices is a spherical variety, then there's some combinatorial procedure, or at least like guess that you can define some subgroup of G check and then some representation uh, of this subgroup um, called VX. Uh, and then, so basically the point is somehow using like analysis on like, or studying fun like short spaces of X, you'll be able to, you should be able to detect like functoriality with respect to this subgroup. And then also uh, like, somehow if you do this, these kind of zeta integral stuff, you should be able to, or like, okay, if you take like a zeta integral squared or something like a period squared, then you're supposed to get the L function corresponding to this representation, the V. Uh, and so like the general conjecture is that one, so you can put this into, you can package all this information by saying you take G check times the representation, think of it as like a variety, but then you quotient out by, by the diagonal copy of this subgroup. And this thing is supposed to be a Hamiltonian um, variety, meaning it's symplectic and it has a moment map. And then uh, in these cases, you're always supposed to have this equivalence of categories where on this side, you have basically some categorification of the short space of X of F. Um, and then the spectral side should be some kind of, so I didn't mention the grading, but some kind of grading and then uh, modules for the ring of functions of uh, this M check, uh, which are equivalent with respect to G check. Is G is not arbitrary. Sorry? G is not arbitrary. G is any group. Uh, now G is arbitrary. Okay. Like this is supposed to, there are some like technical conditions, but basically it's supposed to be any. So the spherical variety, I guess I should say, it's like the data of a spherical variety comes attached with a group on which it acts with some conditions, but yeah, so it should be like arbitrary. This picture. Reductive, arbitrary reductive group. Right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, how this uh, uh, connect to the classical long lens? Uh... Um... That's an example, I mean, that they just quite a friendly uh, interpretation. I mean, it, that uh, uh, philosophical, philosophic way how to say that it just, uh, yeah, like uh, um, automorphic representation and uh, um, yeah, that's, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the color outside that, the, uh, if the, uh, how to see that? Um, well, I guess the compatibility is like, Kind of you need this is some, some kind of extra data on top of the usual Langlands because um, well so in the usual Langlands like you have some like or automorphic I guess, let's say representation pi and then you expect it to be match or at least a parameter so sort of something from some Gala group to uh, G check. Um, but now the extra data is like you have this X around. So some kind of integral involving like X and then also or restricted to like pi, like first this thing being not equal to zero is supposed to mean that like your parameter actually lifts to this subgroup. Um, and then moreover, like roughly speaking, you want this thing to be equal to an L function. Um, well, it just happened. And so the L function, well, it should be attached to pi, but then which dual representation 
should it be it'll be the one like specified by this v uh this vx okay so this, yeah, is, so your, you, this is your basic function theta x what i mean gives you the basic function uh, yeah roughly well so kind of um so this was supposed to be autom like automorphic but basically yeah in the local uh, theory uh, like automorphic just, is way away i mean we are just talking about local i think uh yeah okay so locally it's just like i mean there's some more general thing but like in this kind of rough picture i wrote yeah like it's just the kind of indicator function for x of o so that's the inverse Sataki transform of the L function, more or less, right? Right, yeah. All right. Uh, does, um, does this conjecture recover? Or can you recover geometric Sataki from this conjecture? Uh, yeah, so, um, so basically in that case, like X is, or let me erase this stuff. Like, so in that case, X is G, but the group acting is two copies of G. And so that means like in this picture, so X is G. So then you want this side is kind of a cotangent thing. And then the question is what is like, yeah. So on the other side, so this is acted on by G times G. And then on the other side, like, so the dual group is G check times G check. And, but then what is the smaller kind of G check X inside of here? So it's the diagonal copy of G check. And then like, what is V X? It's this adjoint representation uh, for G check. And so if you write that down or it'll say something like, well, this thing is supposed to be, um, uh, Okay, so this is just G check dual mod G check. Um, but you, if you kind of write it in this uh, like M check way, that just means uh, what you get is that this is also the same as kind of modules for the cotangent of G check, uh, echo ray under G check times G check. Um, but so, yeah, so the point is like I mean, usual Satake kind of um, like doesn't really see this part. It, it just sees like what is kind of quasi coordinate sheaves on a point mod G check is just representations for G check. Uh, and so that's like, that's what usual Satake sees. Um, but then you know, if you, also kind of want to specify something about like Plancherel measures, then you'll get this Lie algebra. Yeah, and I'll, well, okay. So I'll come back to this a little bit. So this is also known as derived geometric Satake, uh, but it can be thought of like in this picture as just some geometric or categorical version of Harshandra's Plancherel formula. Uh, okay, yeah, so this is some big general prediction about how you can like produce L functions. Uh, although, yeah, like, or I'll get to some, something, some caveat a little later. But so one interesting thing, so, okay, so as I said, Goldman JK corresponds to like this, this matching, but so like, this is just not actually relevant to this talk or it's un clear what, how you would be able to prove this, but like there's some predictions from physics that actually like you can swap, like when you have this matching between two cotangent bundles, for example, like you, if you swap the sides, like, so I move this over to this side. Uh, okay, so here G is GON times GON. So I kind of switch from G check to G. Uh, like, now, if you swap it like this prediction from the previous page should still be true, 
Um, but now, so now this thing has the role of X. So it's saying that somehow if you use X and you like write down some integral, then you should be getting like, well, you should basically be getting the L function for N by N matrices. Um, but okay, so there's some shuffle evolutions hidden somewhere that I'm not gonna bother saying, but like, so if you up to shuffle evolution, this is the tensor product representation. Uh, and so probably not so easy to see, but like this space actually will correspond to like rankin selberg convolution, uh, which produces the tensor product L function. Uh, so like the, the only th kind of hint of this is that, so you consider this as a space where uh, like one copy of GLN acts just on the left, but then the other copy of GLN acts on the right on GLN and then by the standard representation on V. Uh, but then, so this thing, it has a open orbit that has stabilized the diagonal mirabolic subgroup. And okay, so globally that kind of explains where you get mirabolic Eisenstein series from. And then some, the, so in fact, this space is the affine closure of this like uh, open subgroup. And the fact that you have an affine closure this corresponds to the fact that in this Eisenstein series, there's some normalizing factors. These are the same representations of GLN that you are putting it. Um, you have V tensor V. I mean, does it mean to the same representation? So you're basically. I, it's still the standard. Is that... I know, but you're taking two copies. I mean, you are. You said you you're saying you are getting rank in Selberg. Right. Yes. So this these are just pi and pi cross pi that you are getting. I mean, two representation. I mean, same representation of GLN. I mean, as an L function, you will have a pair of representations, right? Uh, no. Now, now it can be any arbitrary pair. No, I know, I know. But the same thing. I mean, I mean, I see V tensor V. I mean, that's that you would think that would be the same representation on both V's. Uh, is it a pi cross pi or is it a pi one cross pi two? It's a pi one cross pi two. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Uh, um, yeah, this this more this was more meaning like you get like pi one cross pi two, but then of standard tensor standard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that's general enough. Um, okay, but yeah, so this is only like some predictive mechanism that, but it's not like if you know one of these, the other one like becomes automatic in any way. Uh, but it's just kind of very miraculous that such a thing, uh, like you can get new predictions, like if you just kind of formulate it in this way. Okay, so this is just kind of a side or very interesting side remark. Um, so, so there's, I guess the previous story, or there's another direction that to generalize, which comes to the back to like why the title had monoid in it. Um, because, so there's actually, or there are a lot of kind of smooth spherical varieties, but I guess in some sense, there's not so many, for example, they're all classified and there's some like table that has all of them. Um, but for like, they're not going to give you all Kind of representations of the dual group. But so Braverman and Kajdan have this proposal that kind of proposes how you can get any L function in a way that generalizes go to monitor K. Uh, so, but so to start, you have an arbitrary reductive group G, well, arbitrary except that it needs to have some kind of determinant map to a GM, uh, meaning it can't be semi simple. And then you choose. Uh, okay, so for now, let's just say some irreducible representation of the dual group. Although there's, Ngoa has some modification that can do, I think, an arbitrary representation. Uh, and then, uh, froze a little. 
Okay. Um, so then, like, since the representation is just corresponds to some like highest weight data, there's a way to uh, from that specify a certain algebraic monoid uh, called M row, which contains G as the group of units. So if you took standard representation of GLN, then this monoid will just be N by N matrices for GLN. Uh, and now, so kind of part of the proposal is that well, you want some kind of uh, short space uh, that corresponds to somehow it's but like not or some special short space or exact basically exactly to give you what you want. Um, but kind of for analysis, you would want maybe like a basically like some description of it as certain functions on something. Uh, and so the proposal is that, well, like let's just pretend like, so if there were no problems with this being infinite dimensional and everything, uh, then you could consider perverse sheaves on it that are G of O equivariant. Um, and then if you take like apply function sheaves, like dictionary, meaning you take trace of Frobenius, then you would get a bunch of functions. And like, you could just by definition set that to be the function, the short space, uh, the, at least on the bi invariant functions. Um, and so the bullet means that like to make this make sense, in fact, you want this space, but where the point, you, the open subset where the points are actually just G of F, um, but the topology will be very different. Uh, this is just some technical thing. Uh, but the point is like just <laughs> kind of uh, even like basically for infinite dimensional uh, and okay, I guess an important thing is that this thing is now a singular variety, um, but which means that like M rho of F is some like horribly singular infinite dimensional variety. Uh, so right now there's no like kind of direct or way in order to define perverse sheaves on, or there's no general theory of how to define perverse sheaves on that. Um, but, but actually, nevertheless, like basically if you just want the functions, there are some, like there are some mechanisms where you like actually use a global curve and then you like, there's a not so obvious definition but it should give you the right short space. Uh, but anyways, the point is like the conjecture is that if you use this short space and then define zeta integrals a la Kodamanjaka okay theory, then you will get like the L function corresponding to the row that you started with. Uh, so this is just, or it's very broad because well, there's infinitely many and you're supposed to get kind of any L function you want. Uh, and so that was kind of the analytic version, but then you can also make a uh, geometric version. And so here before I kind of considered some derived category, but there's like absolutely no good way to define that. Uh, so instead, if you consider the abelian category, uh, then the, basically there's some, the conjecture is that you consider this perverse sheaf category, then you will also be able to see spectrally uh, this like row and row dual. Um, and so here, this means the exterior algebra of such a thing. Um, so before I had kind of symmetric algebra, but actually uh, like hidden here, the relation between this and what I was previous talking about is that this really is related to some kind of symmetric algebra. Uh, okay, but bio duality. Okay, but these are just some technical points, but the point is that uh, like one direction in which we were are planning to kind of investigate, like, but we wanted to know what happened in like the Goldman JK case is uh, like geometrically, you want to study this kind of categorical short space and you should be able to like see this, uh, the, or basically the NL function pop up, but in this kind of categorical framework. And so like the result I said, I stated before for the go to Manja K case, like we will recover this in the case where this is N by N matrices. But 
or in a way that I will not explain. Uh, all right, so that's kind of the end of the uh, like motivation or connections. Are there any uh, questions? Did you, did, you mention, did you mention some kind of um, relationship between um, the proper Brahman Kaushan picture and the Benzvi Sakharius and Agatesh picture when like both things on both sides are comparable? Um, yeah, so basically, I guess like there's not actually so much intersection between the two because um, these things are uh, like, like these varieties are never smooth except basically for the M by N matrices case. Uh, but there is actually like, um, I guess like the summary is just like in the previous cases. So somehow in the secondary advantages cases, like you, you basically consider some like indicator function for x of o because x is smooth and then you kind of satake so transform that to get the l function um, but then here the point is because it's singular you want to consider like some function that's really like an ic coming from an ic of x of o uh, like meaning intersection complex um, so there is a general kind of thing that encompasses both of these where you just like allow singular varieties and then like then basically it's saying if you use like certain like perverse functions coming from perverse sheaves in both cases you should be able to get uh, the l function isn't this the i mean this paper of boutier go and saccharides i think and, and discusses those stuff i mean in, in the use of volume you know that paper of which you... yeah, yeah yeah so so they do it or so they in that case they show that like this ic function for this m row if you satake transform it it will give you uh the l function for row mm -hmm. um uh but so it kind of it doesn't give kind of this more categorical um equivalence of categories uh, and i guess i uh, i feel like and the, the categorical equivalence should also be like I mean, have be insightful for like further applications of this Braverman Kajdan stuff. Of course, but I mean they were just trying to do Braverman Kajdan, I think they weren't thinking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the, yeah, so yeah, that their paper does like fit into all of this picture. Uh, okay, so I'll now talk a little about like the properties. Uh, but so I already said this. So this is called the derived Satake equivalence, uh, which was proved by Professor Kramnikov and Finkelberg uh, following like previous ideas of Ginsburg. Uh, and so I guess we already stated it. It's just that kind of if you consider the uh, Satake categories or G, G of F mod uh, by invariant G of O, uh, then so if you only looked at this, like on the perverse sheaf level, th then as an abelian category, what you would see is just representations of G check. But the derived level basically means that you also pick up, uh, it's more like a categorification of Harshandra Plancherell decomposition. So beyond just the, the Langlands parameters, you also pick up the, harsh, the, yeah, the Plancherell measure which is this adjoint representation. Uh, and so uh, the reason I mentioned this is that, all right, so this, this is uh, like, it fits into this general prediction, but so on this uh, kind of short space, you have this, this natural action of, or G of F, I guess, by invariant, where, uh, I'm being lazy and writing G for two copies of GLN. And so you can, also oh, there's Hecke actions on the left-hand side, and then you would want to say what this Hecke action corresponds to on the spectral side. 
and and, and like compatible with this derived Satake equivalence. And so the iPad seems to constantly lag a little. Uh, so on the left, so you have this natural kind of convolution action. And then on the right, so it should be some kind of action of uh, this category. Uh, and the point is, since I identified uh, the right-hand side with some functions on this cotangent bundle, so any cotangent bundle uh, has a moment map, which goes to or the Lie algebra of the group that's acting. Uh, and then, so once you have that, then like you can get this action. Okay, so so the action is just by you kind of take some sheaf here and then you pull it back under the moment map to uh, this bigger space and then you tensor it with whatever you had upstairs. Uh, So uh, for the first theorem, is it only for the function field or just very general? Uh, the first one is for function fields oh. uh, or, but well, yeah. So the first one is only for function fields. The usual Satake, the usual geometric Satake, there's also a mixed characteristic version or like two slightly different versions, one due to Xu and Zhu and then uh, like this other uh, version. There's a, the wit vector version is due to Xu and Zhu, and then this B de Ram plus version is due to Fargus and Schulze. Uh, but I think Xu and Zhu uh, and Tamir Hamel, his student, are working or have some kind of mixed characteristic version um, of the derived stock A in, in the works. Okay, thank you. Okay, so sorry, I have to keep line. So uh, one, okay, so one very interesting thing is that so basically we we can prove this previous equivalence uh, without saying anything about Fourier transform, but so if you um, so but there is a compatibility here, which is that. Uh, so just like in, with functions, since MN is a vector space, you have Fourier transform. So also on the level of sheaves, you can define a Fourier transform. Um, and, but there's some slight, I guess, okay, so there's some like adjectives that you need to put in because of this infinite dimensionality stuff. Um, basically, but because of these adjectives, like the right-hand side, the, the grading changes slightly or this two, and zero becomes a zero and a two. Um, and also, so really like this Fourier transform, it should be going to MN dual. So there's some kind of Chevrolet evolution hidden in there. But so because of that Chevrolet evolution, you, get, you can identify V and V dual uh, up to the Chevrolet evolution. Uh, and so after this identification, like, so just, if you just look at this, this space, these two spaces, like there's a natural just involution at the level of spaces where you send like this, this copy with the two to this other copy with the two, and then this copy with the V in degree zero to V dual in degree zero. So you, you kind of swap these two coordinates. Um, and then the, the compatibility is that, so under this equivalence that we proved, like just doing the swapping on the spectral side uh, corresponds to Fourier transform on the uh, like analytic or sheaf constructible sheaf side. Uh, so, like basically, I find this very interesting because, uh, like this, if you knew the equivalence and you had the spectral thing, then you can kind of define Fourier transform uh, just by going kind of this way around the square. Um, and so, okay, so in this case, it's not so, I guess, interesting since everyone knows about how to do Fourier transform, but in these like Barbara and Kajan cases, 
uh, like kind of the format, it always has this format where you have like two representations um, with like a shift. Uh, and so it seems like if you could have some kind of spectral equivalence, then there is always some kind of swapping you can do. And like, you know, it's desirable to get these like, uh, well, Brabham Kajdan style Fourier transforms on the, these singular monoids in that case. Uh, so this could be some different, I guess, perspective on how to investigate that. Uh, okay, so then the, the last part, which, uh, so this is, I guess, a property, but actually the property that is proved before the main theorem, like to, or this is part of the proof. And this part is, I think, it's, uh, well, I don't see any kind of, parallel in the analytic situation. So this is where you know, this investigation diverges from like what happens uh, just classically. Uh, so there's on this category of sheaves, uh, you can define, so here I basically you can take cohomology of these things, uh, but because it's, there's like a quotient by G in there, uh, it's what's called equivariant cohomology. And there's two versions, so one with compact support and one without it. Uh, and then both of them will basically go to modules over the cohomology of point mod G, or which is just the classifying space uh, BG. And, and so some a fact is that, so the cohomology of this space uh, with this equivariant in there is also equal to cohomology of VG. So the rough idea is just that this thing is some infinite dimensional matrices, but since it's still a vector space, it's basically still contractible. So you can contract it and you'll just end up with cohomology of BG. And then so it's like a fact that cohomology of BG is just going to be uh, vial group invariant functions on uh, the Lie algebra of T. Um, but so here, so my G was GLN times GLN. So T is really uh, two characteristic polynomials of degree, or sorry, T mod W will mean two characteristic polynomials of degree N. Um, and, okay, so then the question is, like we had this spectral description in terms of some functions on this other cotangent bundle. Like what does this cohomology functor correspond to uh, spectrally. And so here, I guess basically there's some general or in this previously known cases like derived Satake, it always has something to do with a uh, cost and slice. Um, and so the first fact is that, so this was the spectral kind of space that we were interested in. Um, but if you take, so if you just take the GIT quotient with respect to GLN times GLN, uh, you will just get um, this kind of T mod W, so two copies of characteristic polynomials. And the identification is actually just that like, you first map to via the moment map to uh, G check, and then you take the GIT quotient under conjugation. And well, so by Chevrolet, this thing is equal to T mod. W. Um, and okay, so I guess concretely, I should say, like this thing, what this moment map is going to be. Uh, okay, so you want to go to GLN times GLN, or, and then you can identify GLN dual with GLN using the trace pairing. So this just sends like G, some matrix A, some vector, and then some covector. Uh, I think in the first copy, it will just be like G. And then the second copy you take, or sorry, not G, A. And then in the second copy, you take uh, the conjugation of G on A, and then you add on this uh, V times C. So that'll be some other matrix, M by N matrix. Uh, basically just that, and then you take characteristic polynomials of these two things. So it's some sort of interesting 
uh, but computable like uh, kind of invariant theoretic uh, thing. Uh, and then, so cost and section, so cost of section is really just what happens if you take um, like, like the Lie algebra of G and then you take this GIT quotient and then you ask if there exists a section going in the other direction. Uh, so here you can also ask, is there a section going in the other direction? Uh, and then, so it turns out the answer is yes, but there's actually two non-equivalent or like non-translation equivalent sections. Uh, and so this, okay, so I'll write down one of them. One of them is just, so I have two characteristic polynomials. Um, so for GLN, like a special way to get a section that's conjugate, conjugate to this constant section is like this, this nice format. Um, but then, and then, so the V I just put in uh, B minus A. So B is this characteristic polynomial considered as a vector and A is this the other one. Uh, and then uh, EN just means like zero, zero, one. Uh, but the, the point is that if you like chase through what I did with the moment map before, like if you take this thing and then you add on this times this, you'll actually end up just getting uh, like this section, but with A replaced with B. And then, so when you then take invariance, you're going to just get back like one copy of A and one copy of B as the characteristic polynomials. Uh, and then similarly, uh, so you can do it for this, this non-equivalent one is that, so you do the same thing, except you take the transpose of this uh, section on the matrix part and then so there was this asymmetry where somehow all the information was on uh, V and not on uh, the V dual, but then here, so on V, it's just the, the basis vector. And then on the dual copy, it's uh, B minus A transpose. Uh, and so the, basically the answer is like, kind of the two cohomology I described will just end up being restriction of your like sheaf or your module uh, along these cost sections. Uh, but, but so one other, or, okay, but so somehow why this is relevant is because, so you can consider this uh, like G check action on this section. Um, and so if you consider this for the kind of just the case of the adjoint action on the Lie algebra, this is where the, this, the regular centralizer or yeah, the, the centralizer comes up, which is important in like this theory. But it's, it's interesting that for this particular like, cotangent bundle, this action is actually on the section is actually going to be free. So there's no like there's no stabilizer here. Uh, so in this way, like if you just take the G check action uh, on the two sections, you're going to get some open embeddings. Um, and Okay, so you can do this twice, and then it happens that these two open subsets, they're both a co-dimension one, but then when you take the union, then it actually is co-dimension two. Uh, and so the relevance is that somehow if you have something inside an affine normal variety of co-dimension two, then that kind of completely determines its ring of functions. Uh, so now, like, so the compatibility, so this is this equivalence that we wanted, uh, and then, so if you take cohomology or one of the types of cohomology, uh, this is going to correspond to just restricting along the section, but I can also write it instead of as restricting on the section, I restrict to the open um, together with this equivariance uh, where G check is just acting like by left translation on G check. And so like this, this diagram is supposed to be commutative, but kind of, the way we prove everything is that kind of you first sort of, or you show kind of this compatibility without proving the full equivalence in some way. And then after you know that, and then these facts about co-dimension two, like you can use this property to then recover like some kind of equivalence, uh, desired equivalence on the full ring of functions. Uh, and yeah, so a lot of these like, derived equivalences go in this kind of pattern, uh, which I guess is more just a geometric thing. Uh, 
but somehow the the interesting thing is somehow in it points out that like you should be able to have like in these cases where you start with some space and then you want some L function somehow like this like Hamiltonian variety that you cook up from the L function is supposed to satisfy or is probably supposed to satisfy some like interesting invariant theory that's actually related. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah. Um, so that's it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So any questions, for Jonathan? Yes. Can you say um, a little bit about the map H, like the cohomology map? So, um, yeah, I, I guess, um, yeah, why you land in this um, cohomology of BG? Yeah, so uh, like the way I think about it is kind of, uh, Like I really, I guess think of, so it's sheaves on this thing, but then so like there's just a natural map where like you go to point mod G of O. Uh, and, and so cohomology is really just like push forward along this thing. Um, but now like the, the fact is because like G of O, if you just evaluate at like zero for uh, in the, or so this is like G, it will racket T. So if you just evaluate at T equals zero, like the kernel uh, is unipotent. Uh, and, and so basically like if you do, or unipotent things do not have any cohomology or any, or no cohomology and also no like equivariant cohomology. So that means basically you'll end up in things like after you take cohomology, it will just, it'll be something that is acted on by um, cohomology of point mod G of O, but that's going to just equal cohomology of point mod G. Because of this unit for um, and yeah, there's some, okay, so yeah, basically there's, this is how you define cohomology and then compactly supported sort of corresponds to P lower shriek. Uh, but in fact, or there's some technical things on how to define this, but uh, like you can actually define it as instead, like you can go from just include the point zero mod G of O, and I'll just call this map zero. And you can define this as like pulling back by uh, zero. All right, any other questions? Yes, thanks, Jones. Thanks for having me. Thank you. It was a nice talk.